Some say traveling to other planets is how humans ensure the survival of our species. But leaving the protective bubble of the Earth means exposing ourselves to the dangers of space radiation. Radiation exposure is one of the main hazards of, of human spaceflight. On the Artemis I mission, two radiation-detecting phantoms were launched into space to find out more about the risks to astronauts of the future. Many of the hazards of human spaceflight are immediate, very straightforward, immediate hazards to, to life and limb. And, and radiation is, is a hazard that will come and often will come and get you later. Space radiation has two sources. One is this ever-present background of galactic cosmic rays. And these are highly energetic particles that are formed by all sorts of interstellar processes, many of them by supernova. And they traveled a long way to, to get here. And because they're so energetic, they're very difficult to shield against. The highest risk uh, is associated with uh, cancer and um, they could also uh, cause degenerative diseases of different organ systems. Astronauts are more likely to develop cataracts at a young age due to galactic cosmic rays. They may also increase the likelihood of atherosclerosis and cognitive decline. The other kind of uh, space radiation effect we have is uh, radiation from the sun. These are solar particle events and they consist mostly of energetic protons. They come in a burst when there's an eruption on the sun. This solar radiation can also cause acute radiation syndrome, which induces nausea, fatigue and can result in immune suppression. We had this galactic cosmic radiation and with this, the, the solar particle events. Uh, but what shields us against radiation on Earth is the magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field outside of low Earth orbit into this radiation environment where we want the crew to go, where we want the crew to stay potentially in the future for a long time. But it's very important to us to understand the radiation environment in, in the vehicle, uh, understand the controls that we've put in place to mitigate the effect of severe space weather. The advantage of the Artemis One mission was that it was an uncrewed mission. So that means we had enough place to put the radiation detectors in the spacecraft where we flew two female phantoms, so you could say two female astronauts almost, within the Orion capsule. And this was to measure the radiation load on humans, on simulated humans, as you may call it, for the upcoming uh, Artemis missions. They are built up of epoxy resin with different densities. And with this, you can simulate the various organs of the human. So you can simulate the lungs, you can simulate the tissue. The phantoms, named Helga and Zohar, were equipped with radiation detectors. We differentiate them into passive and active ones. So the passive ones, they just accumulate the dose during the mission and we get a total dose for the mission. And the active ones, they give time-resolved data. So for the, for the first time, we have time-resolved data of the dose for the whole mission. So um, from launch to uh, landing on, on Earth. We chose female phantoms um, because we don't have any data for the dose distribution in the female body. We have more and more female astronauts on the ISS and there will be also a female astronaut on a moon mission and landing on the moon and um, therefore it's important to, to add these data. The breast is a radiosensitive organ and it's prone to radiation-induced cancer. But of course, we, we want to make it possible that also women go to Mars. And therefore, we want to know better uh, the dose in, in the breast and understand better the risk that is associated with it. Helga and Zohar were loaded into the Orion capsule and launched on the 16th of November 2022. The first phase of the flight was passing through the Van Allen belts. So the Van Allen belts were, um, I believe, the first genuine in, in space discovery. Um, nobody, nobody knew they, they existed until they were measured by a satellite. They consist of charged particles that are trapped by the Earth's magnetic field. And so what it means by a particle is trapped is it kind of follows this spiral. You have, you have the magnetic field lines that you kind of see like a bar magnet coming out from the, the, the North Pole and going into the South Pole. And then these particles, they, they sort of spiral up and down them. There is an outer radiation belt mostly made up of electrons and an inner radiation belt primarily made of highly energetic protons and that somewhat resembles solar radiation. 
you can use the inner belt or these proton belt crossings uh, as, a, as a proxy for a solar path. We measured the radiation dose during the Van Allen belt crossings, uh, which was uh, approximately 8 to 15 percent of the total dose for the whole mission, lasting only half an hour for the inner proton belt crossings. We also measured the outer electron belt crossings, and it's interesting to see that for these, there was almost no increase in dose, because these outer electron belts are electrons. And electrons have not that high energies. And then, of course, we measured the radiation load for over 25 days in free space, so the galactic cosmic radiation. We measured this with the active radiation detectors from NASA and ESA, but we also measured it with the detectors we had installed of the phantoms. We see um, that for galactic cosmic rays, the differences for the different organs are not um, huge. They are all in the range of one um, milligray, but um, Looking at the traversal through the inner radiation belt, we see uh, strong differences because this radiation field is directional and um, the uh, protons uh, come with a specific direction on the body. And so the um, lower part of the body is better shield than the, the upper part. And uh, we see that the, uh, the dose to the spine, for example, is the lowest one and to the, to the um, skin on the torso is, is the highest. So this is something you can always use uh, to extrapolate, for example, how much radiation would you get when you fly to Mars. That's also part of what we uh, put into the paper. But this is like a unique data set which can be used then for extrapolation missions. There are still more results to come from Helga and Zohar, and these will better inform space agencies on how best to protect astronauts from space radiation on missions like Artemis. As people go further afield, as we go into these longer duration missions, as we head out to Mars, it's going to mean that people are going to be spending increasingly large amounts of time in these radiation environments. And so we have to understand how best to protect people against them, how best to mitigate them, and in some cases, how best to live with them, because it may not be practical to shield everything.